we all have to try and optimize our personal behavior. And it starts with little things like separating trash, like not using your car and all these things. But there's also an, an overarching concept. We have to reduce consumption. Reducing consumption, only then will we get to a circular economy. We live and work in a world of interlocking systems where many of the problems we face are dynamic, multifaceted, and inherently human. We believe that design thinking can help solve these problems to provide answers, but big answers can only be found by asking big questions. Welcome to The Big Question, an IDEO podcast. I'm your host, Deetra Williamson. Hi, I'm Dietria Williamson, your host of IDEO's The Big Question. And in this episode of The Big Question, I'm super excited, filled with joy that we are joined by Franz Block, IDEO partner, and Konstantin Schwab, who's Wirelane's CEO. And today we're going to talk a bit about how might we empower society to move rapidly towards a cleaner future. I'm super excited to be here with you both. If I had clapping sounds, I would be having them in the background. Please introduce yourself and tell me more about how you two met. Hey, Jira. Thank you so much for having me. And it's my greatest pleasure to be part of this format. My name is Konstantin Schwab. As you said, I'm the founder CEO of Wirelane, an infrastructure company in the field of e-mobility. I'm a father of three. I'm based in Munich. I'm a serial entrepreneur, and uh, I've started a number of businesses before in my life. And I first uh, had a touch point with renewable energy about 13 years ago, and uh, I couldn't let go. I was uh, so um, excited about the topic that uh, I developed it further to a point where we're now um, trying to make the, the energy revolution happen with Wireline in Germany and, and everywhere else abroad. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to going deeper just into your entrepreneurial route. It's super fascinating. I can't wait for our listeners to hear more about that. Tell me about you, Franz, a pioneer in design. Yeah, I'm Franz Block. As you said, like partner at IDEO, I mainly work at the intersection of building breakthrough brands and products and create the conditions for transformative teams to ship them and scale them. And, you know, as a trained digital designer, I, I mainly grew up working like internet era ways of working styles. And, and I'm really passionate about climate era ways of working. And I think like the way, you know, Wireline is such a great example of like, you know, working with entrepreneurs and visionaries and pioneers in this field. And it's, yeah, that was like how we met for the first time. But I think we have a lot of things in common, Constantine, right? Like we, we explored that. Want to talk more about that or? Absolutely. I hope we'll get there in a moment. Yeah, Constantine, you know, you really are a trailblazer and leading the way when it comes to energy change. We're going to go a little bit deeper later into what drove you and led you to that. But first, tell me this interesting story about how you two met. I know you all have known each other for a long time, you know, even outside of just IDEO. Talk to me a little bit about that. Sure. So I've been a very close friends with one of the partners at IDEO. And it's always been very inspiring for me to learn more about the, the, the idea of design thinking, which to me was new. I don't have a background in economics. I'm a political scientist by training. So there's many, many things uh, I let, uh, had to learn, learn the hard way. And uh, when I met one of the, the partners at IDEO, Charles Hayes, who is now heading IDEO in, in Asia, it was uh, very eye-opening for me. And uh, I always hoped for an opportunity to work with a firm like IDEO. But it took many, many years until that opportunity actually popped up. And that was Wyoming. When we started Wyoming, I instantly approached my friend Charles and I said, uh, can we work together? What can we do for each other? And, uh, and he said, I should talk to the people at the Munich office. And that's basically how I met Franz. And then, yeah, as you said before, it instantly clicked. We, we share a, a past uh, without knowing from each other. But uh, we discovered that when we started working together. And uh, we, we definitely approached the project uh, with high spirits. And it turned out to be a very successful project. Franz, any builds there? Talk to us a little bit about the past. What's in the past? Yeah, I mean, the main thing that I still like vividly remember is just like when Constantine entered the studio. You know? And I think, you know, like if you see people and you feel like, I always say like it's almost you have a, a same energy and you feel like I could feel like his 
curiosity, like his eyes are like, okay, I want, I want to do this. And like everything he talked about was this idea of like, I want to do this revolution. And it's like, this is the thing I want to do. Like I'm a serial entrepreneur. I know how to do this. This is potentially the most purposeful kind of endeavor I'm on. And I was like, okay, I'm sold. And then what Constantine talked about is like, we both share a, a background in skateboarding. And I think that's the thing of like looking at the city as a playground, looking at infrastructure, it's something that basically just like creates more livable cities until today. Like, I think we, we, we talked about like, you look at benches as like, oh, this is a potential kind of to do something. You even look at curbs and like the flow of the city. And I think I see those things as a common threat, you know, and this idea of wanting to make a city better and wanting to make a city more accessible. I think this whole idea of like that the city belongs to the people, I think is a kind of spirit that I think uh, was very important also to this project. Okay, I have a pop-up question here. So when's the last time you both got on your boards? I can tell you precisely because last summer I started to teach my five-year-old daughter how to skateboard. And uh, then I, I took a couple pretty hard crashes and I had to stop for a number of months because uh, I figured that at age 43, it's not the same as at age 14 anymore. But um, <laughs> that was last summer. That was, that was pretty intense. For me, it was four weeks ago, but because we moved houses and I had to clean out the garage and like I found my old skateboard again. And again, like my son was like, hey, can we do something? And then I tried to show him some tricks and I think like, at this age, it's still okay. Like you can impress, impress little <laughs> kids with very little. If I would have seen myself as like an 18 year old, like doing that, I would like, I think you should step down on this board now. I think you're slightly too old, but that's kind of, it was enough for a five-year-old boy and it was nice to see. Well, I tried to get on a skateboard, but I had someone holding me on my right, someone holding me on my left. I had pads from, you know, my ankles all the way up. And I just thought this this isn't a good look, but super excited. I want to dive deeper into energy change. Constantine, you've worked in the solar industry and, and have successfully excited several digital startups. You mentioned yourself that you're a serial entrepreneur, and then you moved into energy infrastructure. Talk to us a little bit about that switch, that path, what drives your passion. So first of all, it wasn't that obvious. When I started, uh, Franz, you just mentioned it, the exciting thing for an entrepreneur in the, the 90s and 2000s, it was the internet era, right? So it was to start something digital and an internet-based business. However, that turned into, into some precondition for any business. I remember very well speaking to the chief innovation officer at Huawei, the uh, Chinese electronics company and high-tech company. And he said, we don't understand how people still speak about internet businesses because without the internet, there is no business. So it was quite obvious for them, you know, leapfrogging into an economy where the, the internet was just there and you would just take it for granted, which wasn't the case when I started. However, after selling my first company for the first time, I basically had the luxury to think about what I wanted to do with my life. The first company is often something that is based on, on a not so deliberate decision. It's just more um, opportunistic. After having exited that company, I was thinking, okay, first of all, how can I invest money? And then also, what can I do? How can I, I actually create impact with that investment? And then the, the, the perspective completely changes. So that was back in 2007. And in, in Europe, we had this thing called a feed-in tariff. So for the first time, because of a, a highly regulated market environment, you'd be able to make money with the installation of solar power plants, which before wasn't possible. But still back then, I remember very well people laughing about the idea of installing solar power because they said, look, we're a highly industrialized nation and the amount of power, the sheer um, size of the problem, you won't get anywhere with this. And I thought, okay, let's see. But for me at all, uh, after all, it was, it was an investment, you know, and I knew it was going to be profitable. So I started to get into that market. And today we have more than 50% of the energy consumption, which uh, stems from renewable energies, which is fascinating, only a bit more than a decade later. And that trajectory showed me, clearly showed me that things are probably moving into a new direction much faster than we had experienced throughout our lifetime. And I think this is a very important aspect of our doings, just for you as much as for me, Franz, that this law of accelerating returns, how new technologies merge and how we create ever and ever new opportunities at, at much faster speed than in the past. And, and that's super exciting about the, the entire industry we're in. What you call the, the climate era. 
Constantine, I'm curious, you know, you mentioned people laughed initially. So what is it about Constantine that said, you know, I'm going to keep going? Well, it, it's not that people would applaud when you first step on a skateboard, right? So it has a lot to do with that experience and just get, <laughs> getting used to people questioning your deeds, basically. And I think this is why it's important to trace it a bit further back. I think uh, we, we both had this rebellious thing inside of us that, that made us do things differently, change the perspective, and then eventually also accept that people would look upon us or even criticize us harshly for what we we're doing. But in case of solar power, I mean, in an early phase of your entrepreneurial development, you're much more distracted by this kind of criticism. The more you move into new markets, the more you understand that you're getting better at something and that you develop the skill of pattern recognition, the, the more self-conscious you are about these things. Like when I started business now, obviously I have my toolkit, right? I approach things in a very different manner. Many of the tools I've developed together with IDEO, but then there's also other influences. So back then when people laughed, I felt insecure about the, the viability of solar power contributing to, to the energy system as a whole. To be honest, I, I was insecure about that. But I knew that based on, on, on the unit economics that me as an entrepreneur, I could make money of this. So I thought, okay, let's give it a shot anyways, no matter if this is going to be a large contributor to the, the, the way the world uh, will work in a, in a decade from now. I would still give it a shot and, and just try to, to make the best out of it. So, Constantine, ultimately, I think it sounds like bravery. Your bravery came through against all odds. You mentioned tools. Franz, what were some of those tools that IDEO leaned into in the very initial phases with working with, with Constantine and Wirelane? I mean, what is almost like stereotypical is like, you know, that constantly literally showed up with the famous like napkin sketch. I think it was an A5 paper with a, like a sketch of like, hey, we need this kind of infrastructure. And I was like, and we discussed about that. But what we really did is, I mean, we built this first modular portfolio of products, right? An iconic product that at least I felt like allowed Wiling to go into the market, a brand connected to that, and also like starting to design the digital touch points so that the whole holistic experience, I think that's just like how... Constantine also thinks it's like, you know, what's the experience with this brand? It needs to be like a super, we always said like, it needs to shield people from complexity, right? It needs to be simple and delightful. And that's what we wanted to do. But I think one thing that I felt in retrospective that I think we almost did on the go and never talked about is that I think when Constantine is like, hey, this is the company I'm founding and we might merge companies, like we said, like we need to really thoughtfully look at what's the organization that kind of the company culture you want to see. And that's when we kind of remember Constantine when we did the kind of the little book, like I think you called it the Wiley Manifesto, but this kind of book of culture where we talked about values, we talked about the purpose, we talked about rituals. And that was just like fascinating because you took this and you ran with it. And, and I think like it's one of those things where I'm potentially the proudest of is like that this element of like almost the conditions for Wiley to become what it wants to be, I think was potentially at least seated in this project. I don't know what anything else you want to, to add, Constantine. Yeah, I mean, it's a very thoughtful and deliberate process. So that for me as an entrepreneur was new. I told you that my first venture, I started in a very opportunistic fashion. And you basically fix things on the fly, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. But the experience with IDEO was that it creates so much more value if you approach things, uh, a certain class of problems in a much more deliberate way. So also what I wanted to add is uh, this, this idea about customer centricity and how you look at every single person, every stakeholder, which for me was also a new expression, you know, stakeholders, you think about clients, but what about employees? What about the people at the manufacturing side? And if you think about all those stakeholders and you think about how you can make their lives easier, because in the end, the chain always breaks where, where, where it's weakest, right? So if, for example, a product is designed in a way, and, and now we're, we're talking hardware, right? We could apply this to software, any product. But if you produce a product and the person assembling the product doesn't enjoy what he's doing, and I'm really talking about enjoying. I'm not only talking about getting the job done. I'm really about enjoying assembling the product. And if, if the person doesn't have that feeling, and he or she is going to make mistakes. And those mistakes are going to be painful for the entire organization, for society as a whole. And I think this very deliberate process and this thinking things through to the end. And it was, I have to admit, quite of a luxury for me as an entrepreneur. I, I wasn't used to that. So we, it took us a month, right? So we, we really set it up as a, as a pretty sizable project. But in the end, it totally paid off because it solved so many problems 
for us that we still had ahead of us and we obviously didn't know about. So this deliberate kind of thinking, that's that's part of my, my everyday toolkit now. It's a super important learning. Constantine, I love just the discussion that you and Franz are having about the intention around keeping colleagues and really just keeping humans at the center of everything that you're doing. You mentioned before just talking so much about the future and how the work that Wirelane is doing is really future built. How do you see new decentralized energy and the move to e everything? How is that playing out in the future? Where's your leadership? Where does Wirelane sit in that? So first of all, you already mentioned decentralized energy, and that is something we take for granted in the climate era. But let's not forget, 20 years ago, we were not talking about decentralized energy. So we had massive infrastructure that was built around centralized production capacities. And then we would basically evacuate the energy and, and bring it to people's homes using massive landlines. So this is changing and it's changing quickly. And that's a very good thing because decentralized energy allows for a whole different design of the entire energy system. So now what, what brought me to Wyoming and where we think we can make a, a, a significant contribution to this shift is that it's not only the, the production assets, also the consuming assets. So we, we speak about assets in the world of energy, right? So this the car, for example, is an energy asset or a, a solar power plant is an energy asset. So on the one side, and this is where, where digitization kicks in and is also super important, this convergence of technologies, because on the one side, you have fluctuating energy assets like PV power plants. I mean, this, the sun either shines or it doesn't, so you cannot really control that. And on the other side, you have a pretty seemingly chaotic system of consumption, consumption patterns. Yes, you can see those, but the individual asset can't be controlled because in a liberal society, I mean, you just use your car whenever you want to use it, right? And you want it to be fully charged because we're used to this high level of comfort. So to, to bring those two things together, it, it's almost a bit of a paradox. We need a digital layer. And this is where it gets really, really interesting because combining all those energy assets and, and actually intertwining and merging it with a digital layer, that means that you can run the system in a much more efficient manner than you used to be able to run a system in the past. And this is why I'm eventually convinced that decentralized and digitized energy assets will beat the centralized world of the past because it's so much more efficient. And this is something we must face. We need an economic argument or else it's just going to be toys. We'll just be playing. You know, we, we need to convince people also with money and economic arguments and this efficiency lever. This is what, what I am after and, and what this is all about. Constantine, you're essentially on the brink of something that's very new. What are some of the barriers and how has design really leaned into sort of driving greater adoption and acceleration? So design is needed on, on all levels of what we do at Wildlane. And you could start with the customer journey, so the process, how we approach a customer and how we shield the customer from the aforementioned complexity. You could apply it to the product because let's face it, we're dealing with novel technologies. All of a sudden, people are speaking about edge computing or cloud computing anymore. What does that mean? Where do we get the chips from? How do we program those chip, chips? Which software layer do we need? And it goes on and on and on. So at, at every given point, you could just let go and say, okay, I will just accept that this is a very complex matter and I don't care about the outcome of my decisions. Or as we said before, you try to anticipate what's going to happen to your products, to your customers, to your market in three or five years, and you make this a very deliberate process. And when you start doing that, it's partly very painful. It's exhausting. It's also very, very exciting. It's all together. It's a, it's a big, big process. But in the end, it's inevitable because else in this world of tremendous complexity with all these new technologies, without design, we will fail. Franz, any builds on that? I couldn't agree more, right? I mean, like making the complex simple, I think, is one of the key tasks that kind of design has, but also anticipating human behaviors, right? I mean, like you talked about convenience, you know, one of the things like where some of the bad behavior also comes from, right? But I think it's like, let's design solutions that kind of create a certain level of comfort that are simple because you can't burden the people with something they would want to do here, right? I mean, like, I mean, let's face it, I mean, like, for example, charging my phone does take longer than fueling my car. I'm just saying like fueling my car with classic like gas. The future will be that 
it's the same level of comfort. You know, we can't burden people for like, oh, whatever, I need to stand three hours next to my car. And it won't, you know, that technology will help us to do this. Exactly what Constantly says, this kind of decentralized, data-driven, digital layer will help us to kind of make the connection. And it, But it, need, it can't be driven by technology. Technology will be the enabler. We need to understand the human behaviors that all of that works. And that's what design can add. We're better than, I think, anybody else as designers to understand people and then design a delightful solution that kind of answers that real problem. If I may add one thing to that front, and I think this is just as important. Now we're talking organizational design. Because in the end, if you stop with the product design, and I think this is something you guys at IDEO discovered at some point, that it also needs a certain organizational design to actually implement this design process, which was prior only to apply to the product. But then you really need the buy-in from all stakeholders. And now we could go on forever, you know, like how objective secure results impact an organization and how you design your organization around certain values so that you get alignment and buy-in from all stakeholders. I just want to make sure that we, we have the same understanding because design is often, um, is often mixed up with product design, and that's one part of design. But looking at design in a, in a much more holistic manner is extremely helpful to understand how far it goes and how deeply rooted it is in an ideal organization. This is what we try to implement every single day. We try to implement this, I wouldn't call it ideology, but I would definitely call it a mindset in the organization, so it doesn't stop with the product design. That's a really important point because, Constantine, at the moment, design has really been a trailblazer in terms of building these super dynamic products. But to your point, design, really, when you use design as the way through, when you talk about customer service, when you talk about customer experience, when you talk about organizational change, even government change, design is a tool all the way through. Let's talk a little bit more about organizational change. You built an organization from scratch that essentially enables a more circular and planet positive way forward, but you also want your organization to live up to working in this climate era way. How can design help organizations work in a climate era way? And how do we embrace things like a circular, inclusive economy? I mean, those are those are huge tasks. What are you finding? Right. So I, I still like this image of the objective and key result OKR pyramid a lot, which starts typically at the tip of values and it goes down with the vision, the mission. And I'm sure that you and most of our listeners, they, they've seen it. So um, let's talk about values. I think it, it all starts with the values. And this is, as Franz said, something we, we take very seriously at Wireland. So we have a set of core values that are not negotiable. And those core values are basically our North Star, what is guiding us. And uh, we make sure that everyone, every new member of the organization is fully aligned with those core values, which then allows, and this is the other interesting aspect, for the maximum of personal freedom when it comes to the execution of tasks, for example. So once again, let's not mix up the two things. So there's there's things that, that need to be rigid in a way and, and the values, they're a bit abstract, but also we, we try to fill those values with content every single day. I'll give you a very specific example. It's probably the easiest one. One of the values is circularity, right? So we're a, a company that works towards the circular economy. Why do we do this? Well, because we think that people um, expect a certain level of comfort and we want our children to have the same opportunities as we had, but we cannot keep going the way we used to in the past. This is quite obvious. So a circular economy means not only that all the energy we will consume in the future needs to come from renewable sources, but it also means that we cannot consume raw materials anymore. Point. A circular economy means that we will leave the soil untouched. So this is, I mean, let this drop. This is a very complex matter, right? So in order to reach that circular economy, what can we as a company, how can we contribute to the circular economy? So we've implemented certain rules. And, and the good thing about being an entrepreneur is that I can decide. It's, it's limited, my scope, but I can decide. So what I decided is that we do not take um, domestic flights anymore. Full stop. We don't. Somebody wants to travel, which is hardly ever necessary in pandemic times. I mean, we've seen that digital means work, and that is a very good thing for the environment, despite all the, the other aspects of it that come along with it. But 
It means that our employees, for example, if they want to travel, they want to see customers, they take the train. And that is a very important aspect of the organization. And it shows people that this abstract value, circularity, is linked to their everyday experience. And I could go on and on and on with many, many examples of how we try to, to live up to those values. But to answer your question, I think this is where it all starts. Organizational design starts with values, and then it trickles down to all the other layers, the vision, the mission, and eventually all the way down to the task. Constantine, have you experienced any hurdles with this? Because this really is a new way, because you are a purpose-led, driven company by default. You know, this is where you all started. So what have been some of those main hurdles that maybe you've experienced? Well, I mean, there's obviously hurdles when you speak to people that are just used to certain perks, like, for example, say a car, that they can fly business class. There is a certain class of people that are just experiencing these things in other organizations, and, and they might feel um, a bit disturbed by the, the radical approach we take here at Wildane. But then again, the question really is, are we the right organization? And I'm not saying that we're everybody's darling. The way we do things, it's quite radical, right? However, I think that the, the sheer magnitude of the problem we are dealing with, the climate crisis, is for us um, only solvable, the problem, if we approach things in a very radical manner. So I, I'm not saying that we're an organization for everyone. We can't be an organization for everyone. We want to make sure that we find the right people that want to contribute to what we think is the right way how to tackle these problems. So to answer your question, absolutely. I mean, we've we've experienced many, many hurdles. And also we had to let people go because in the end, um, they couldn't function um, under under the set of core values. It is not easy. It is something that, that requires our entire attention. And it's everyday work. It's hard work to implement values in an organization. That's really fascinating and interesting for listeners to hear just even the tough decisions that it sounds like you've had to make in being really values led. Franz, do you have any builds there and when it comes to the role of design in organizational change? No, I mean, I think we touched in the beginning of like, it needs a radical pivot, right? It's not just like, oh, let's adopt a little bit of something. I think it's really, it is good that Wildlane is not an organization for everyone because I think that shows that it pioneers something. I think like also design can help to design this new paradigms, right? It's like, we need to understand that if values are at the core, you know, a value-driven culture, a purpose, culture, you know, that we design also strategies that are kind of long-term and that are really rigorous about the long-term and sometimes potentially more adaptive around the short-term. I think a lot of old school businesses do ex the exact opposite. They are, as they're based more by shareholder value, not shared value, you know, they think in three month chunks and they optimize for that. You know, they're rigorous with the short term three months and they're very fuzzy with the long term. And I think like what Constantly talks about, and that is a design principle almost like is to flip that around and start. I mean, values is something that people hold, right? And once you get again to a human centered or an employee centered organization, that's exactly the design, right? I mean, like that is the design. And then you start through OKRs to incentivize the behaviors that you want to see. That's a very simple way of like building such a modern organization that again, can thrive in the climate era. I think it's not, that's the most important thing. Like the future of the business will and has to thrive in this context. It's not a kind of optional thing. It's like, let's continue linearly or like, let's kind of be still kind of extracting stuff. Like that's not the future, right? And honestly, to everybody that listens to that, like the earlier you start, the further you will be ahead. The longer you wait, the harder it will get. You know, it's just like, it is not easy, but it's doable and it's a choice and you can design those choices. Strategic choices, human choices, organizational choices. And that's where design comes in. I'm learning there's a theme here in terms of Constantine really just being a brave leader. And I do think to get to where the world needs to be, we have to have radically inclusive and brave leaders. So 
Thank you for sharing that, Constantine. Something that you both talked about, I want to go back to, which was just around the tie with mobility. So essentially, Wireline is is a service and maintenance provider in some ways for future mobility solutions and how to help them drive change in the industry. What are some of the biggest challenges for mobility providers, car manufacturers to actually overcome in the near future? And and how does design lean into that? Constantine, maybe we'll start with you from a wireline perspective. Sure. So um, this format is called Big Questions Podcast, right? So um, (laughs) it is a very big question and uh, it, it does affect the by far biggest industry, at least in Germany, which is the car um, industry. And I couldn't say that I want the the industry to undergo this dramatic change it is currently undergoing for a simple reason, because it so deeply impacts also the employment situation in Germany. So I wish I wish they had anticipated all of this much earlier. And yes, it would have been possible to foresee some of the changes. But I'm, I'm a bit worried that it could be too late for some of the players in the industry because of what Franz just said. And there's so much focus on, on, on short-term goals where they're really rigid in terms of their shareholder value, but they were super fuzzy uh, with regards to their long-term goals, which should have been at a much earlier point of time to adapt to, to a world that's changing much faster than they were experienced to. So now getting back to your question, which are the biggest challenges? So the biggest challenges on the side of the automotive industry, the OEMs, the original equipment manufacturers, is definitely to negotiate with all their stakeholders how fast they can adopt the change because the change is always driven by the customer. And in that case, the change comes from various sides. First of all, electromobility, which is a huge change. It means that you have to phase out the combustion engine vehicle. And what that means is that you have to shut down manufacturing plants. You have to shut down huge departments with with hundreds of thousands of employees. I mean, we are talking about numbers here. So that is one thing. Then the other thing is uh, autonomy. Autonomous driving, I mean, I think we all agree that an autonomous vehicle is probably the most complex machine mankind will ever have built if it ever exists. We don't know that, right? But I keep telling my 11-year-old son, you won't need a driver's license, which you typically get at the age of 18 in Germany. So being a a techno utopian again, um, I think it's possible. However, if that effect kicks in, then the entire industry undergoes dramatic change. Personally, I don't even own a car, right? Because I think it's not necessary to own a car in in any major city because of all the micro-mobility that that, um, um, we see popping up. But in the end, I think this is a very big question that car manufacturers haven't fully answered yet because the moment mobility turns into what it actually should be, a modality to get from A to B and not a fetish anymore, an object, a desirable object, then everything changes. And then the number of cars hopefully will decrease to a tenth of what we what we see today. So this is the car manufacturing industry. Then on our side, on the infrastructure side, and that all pays into the, to the same thing to that, this transformative process. When we started with Wireline, you can imagine people would just look at us the same way they looked at me when I started to build my first power plant. They were like, what are you guys trying to do here? You're trying to build an entirely new infrastructure. But then I'm thinking, if you think about the, the history of the oil industry and the car industry, what if I pitched you the following idea? I would say, pitch your, my business plan it looks as follows. I will drill a chemical and highly toxic substance in a region of the world that is highly conflicted, basically a war region. I will then ship the substance. I will refine the substance and ship the substance to the other end of the world to burn it in a machine that has has an efficiency degree of less than 10%. What would you think? You would think it's insane. It's an insane plan. But this is exactly what the world has looked like over the last 100 years. So now we're basically just turning this whole thing upside down and we're saying, okay, listen, what we are actually building is just a minor layer, mostly digital layer, on an existing infrastructure, which is the electricity grid, to make it accessible to a new class of energy assets, which is the electric vehicle. However, even to get there, this, this minor step takes a lot, a lot of effort from many, many stakeholders, decision makers in the political sphere, um, regulatory bodies, uh, obviously the, the electrical component manufacturing industry, you can imagine how many layers of complexity there are in order to set up such an infrastructure. But I still think out of all the options we have, it's by far the best. So again, I'm I'm super optimistic that we're going to be able to solve this problem. But yes, you're you're raising a very big question here. And Constantine, doesn't the 
new way forward present new jobs, present new opportunities? It's to your point, it's a new infrastructure. Do you find that there's a lot of convincing needed around this new way forward? So when it comes to the jobs, I mean, speaking about the, the car industry is very different than speaking about the, the charging infrastructure industry because the car industry is job heavy, which is a good thing. So there's a lot of labor in, involved. Um, and that industry is changing because the complexity of the vehicle is changing. However, let's not forget, we've already had more than 100 years of constant improvement of manufacturing processes, which led to a situation where the amount of physical labor is dramatically reduced already in existing fabs. So yes, but this industry, there is a certain risk of at least short or midterm risk that the amount of people needed to manufacture the goods um, will decrease. In the infrastructure business, it's quite the opposite because the oil industry is extremely cash heavy. It's cash rich, but it pollutes the planet. And that cost is obviously socialized. So they don't pay for the pollution. Not yet. We've seen court rules over the last couple of months that uh, seem promising in, in the sense that the, those companies will actually have to pay for what they do to the planet and to future generations. But this industry hardly employs people compared to the amount of money they make and compared to the problems they cause. So if you compare the oil industry to what we do, yes, I think it's a huge opportunity also for the labor market. With regards to the car industry, um, I, I see the, a bit more, I'm a bit more worried that in the short to midterm, we'll actually lose jobs. So you've sort of briefly touched on government, and I want to talk a little bit more about government change because I can only imagine that they are a key stakeholder in this huge pivot and impact that you're driving. You're surrounded by standards and, and legal constraints that you need to work within or around all the time. I remember our conversations about, here we go, let's see how good my my German is. Eichrechts. Conformitat. Is that right? <laughs> Fantastic. 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 No, it's it's a, be a beautiful, a very classic German word. It was one of the of, of the words of our project, Eichrechtskonformität. It's just like it represents a lot of like German government rules, right? <laughs> Thank you, Franz, for the support because I said it with such a terrible international American accent there. But talk about this change. I want to hear, Franz, you talk about how design comes into sort of government as part of this list of key stakeholders. And Constantine, maybe talk about the challenges that you have there, or maybe where you've established a way forward, which has been healthy or productive. So first of all, norms have a rather bad reputation because they seem to be limiting your freedom, your actions. But let's not forget norms are super important. I mean, one of the best examples is my beloved iPhone and Mac brand, Apple, is causing a lot of problems because they constantly refuse to accept uh, certain standards and they might be forced, at least in the European Union, to adhere to those standards very soon in order to reduce the, the amount of landfill produced because of, of electronics that uh, only work with a certain category um, of products. What I'm trying to say is that in our case, had it not been a norm that uh, forced the car makers to adhere to certain um, standards, at least with regards to the plugs, we would never have stepped into this business. So this for us was a very important precondition. Without those very basic norms, we wouldn't have made it as wiling as a small company, right? As a startup. So I think it's, it's a good thing. Um, however, the complexity only starts when you look at it as a layer cake with norms from very different industries, for example, the banking industry, why do we have to deal with norms in the banking world? Well, because we process payment transactions. Then you have the electronics world and their safety regulation. Then you have the, the, the political sphere, which regulates the public space, the public domain. It goes all the way get, down to, to the municipality. So the, the complexity really starts when you, when you add all those layers and when you try to find an intersection on which you can actually operate. But this is, this is inherent. I mean, this is something you, you have in, in all societies. And as we are a highly industrialized and highly regulated society that, that tries to really fix the world of tremendous complexity the, the best it can, it's a fact we have to deal with. But it's our job as a company 
to shield our stakeholders, and, and I'm referring to the stakeholders, not only to customers, from that complexity. So this is really an effort we have to make as a company. And Franz, how has design played a role just generally when there are so many different pieces and the complexities that Constantine is referring? I think, again, I mean, like design by definition, like it's human or stakeholder centric, right? It is, it is strategic and systemic in, in its thinking, but it, it tries to make those things like be simple and work out and be delightful for everybody involved. And honestly, I think it is, I mean, designing solutions is one thing. We talked about designing s- systems. I also think like design is at a point where it starts to design entire societies. And I'm saying that, I mean, I mentioned like, that I'm calling in from from Dubai and where we currently work also with the UAE government, you know, and it's just like, it's so interesting that the process is the same. They're all humans. And it's just like, you apply the same rigor of creating simple, delightful, creative human solutions. And suddenly people might be like, yeah, let's create a policy together. And you're like, oh, this is interesting. Yes, let's design a policy. And, you know, I mean, the UAE also, like, you know, they, they want to create a more sustainable economy. They want to make doing good the best way to do business in the UAE. You know, they want to become the host for, or they are now the host for COP28. You mentioned them as a region. Are they kind of the, the poster child of like sustainability? For sure not. But the thing is like, they want to go there. And if you make it a priority and if design goes there and brings people and the planet to the table as a kind of non-negotiable part of that, I think we will succeed. And to Constantine's point, standards are also designed, norms are designed. And again, bridging the interests of different stakeholders is something that design is really, really good at. And I think it's just something we need to optimize for. And we see, I mean, the beauty I see in Europe is like, you know, we have things like we have the new Bauhaus. We have things like, you know, people fighting for the right to repair. There are all of those things where I really feel Europe might play a role and really spearheading that also from a governmental standpoint. But again, it needs to be simple. And I think like the norms and governments and rules like often don't tend to do this, but that's bad design. And good design is still simple, delightful solutions for your citizens. I mean, customers, whatever you call them. I want to take advantage of having both of you as experts in such important work. What This is probably the most important question, I think, on this episode. What can each and every one of us do to actually you know, drive the acceleration, Constantine, that you are referencing in terms of How do we actually move towards this impact that you said? It's a huge hurdle. What can each and every one of us do besides all go and work for IDEO or Wirelane? (laughs) So individual responsibility, I think, is very important. There is a longstanding tradition, especially in Europe, to try and shift that responsibility to governments, to policymakers. And while I think that it is very important to set the frame and to incentivize people and to incentivize the right behavior, it is still very much deeply a personal and human responsibility we all have. Going back to this example I mentioned before that we got rid of our car, you can imagine that we had quite some debate in the family about the question whether we should get rid of of the vehicle. Because being a father of three, owning a vehicle is quite comfortable in certain situations. So are there enough situations in which that comfort actually justifies owning um, a product that is as harmful to environment as a vehicle? And even an electric vehicle is extremely harmful to the environment. Let's not forget about this. So what I keep saying is that we all have to try and optimize our personal behavior. And it starts with little things like separating trash, like not using your car and all these things. But there's also an, an overarching concept. We have to reduce consumption. Reducing consumption, only then will we get to a circular economy. How can we try and, and rid ourselves of this constant desire, which is created by an industry that is advised by professional marketeers and that is trying to sell tangible goods as many as they can? And this is a fact we just have to be facing that while I do not reject the idea of leading a comfortable life, and I want my children to have the same opportunities and all of that, but I do not think that it ought to be necessary for our children 
to own as many physical and tangible things as we did. And I think we have to reduce consumption. I think that is very important. Constantine, that really resonates with me. You know, I have been, I'm sure like many of us, I've been an Apple lover for many years. And it's interesting to see this shift and how it's passing down to generations because my daughter, who's 14, I couldn't wait to, you know, I'm usually waiting to buy the new iPhone, buy the new iPad. And she said, but I don't need a new one. She said, why, why do I, I don't need a new one, mama. And I thought that's great. It just goes to what you're saying about really shifting our ideals when it comes to consumption. There's a, a very personal story I would like to share. So my my son, the oldest one, yeah, he's 11 now. So we make bets. We say silly things like, how you dare to jump from this deadlock over there? Or how about you, you take a cold shower for one minute? You dare to do that, right? So we make these bets. And then the other day we made a bet. And I said, you stand in that cold shower for one minute and you can wish for whatever you want without limits. You just go there and stand there for one minute. So he goes in the shower, ice cold shower, right? Takes a shower for one minute, comes out of the shower. And then I go, so great job. You made it. What do you want? He said, I don't need anything. They're really, I think the kids, they understand. They're sick of it. it there's just too much. This abundance of things. They're really sick of it. So we, we have to use that as an opportunity. 100%. Can't agree more. I think that especially this thing of, that I think there's a whole generation on the rise where consumption is not connected to status anymore. You know, it's not cool only to have the latest and greatest of everything. And I mean, you mentioned Apple and they, you know, they also tried to go more towards right to repair, which was like also asked by the consumer, right? People ask for like self-service. I mean, things like that. I think that is what needs to be the norm. You talk about behaviors, you talk about how do we turn them habits? How do we turn them into rituals that we kind of celebrate that behavior? Because I'm with you. The only thing is like, reduction of consumption and therefore reduction of like carbon emission, right? And, and I think like we're heading into a whole like era of like much more carbon conscious people. And I think also it's not, a, not an excuse anymore to say like, the problem is so big, government needs to fix it. It's like, no, every single one of us needs to do better. And it's absolutely doable. You can eat differently. You can move from A to B differently. And I think people understanding that those little not even sacrifice it. Just think like it's just a change of what and how we do things. It's amazing. And I, I, I still believe that as a society, we will be happier. You know, we will like the planet and people will be healthier. And I think as a species, we will be happier. I truly believe that. I don't think that just more consumption and more cheap stuff makes us happy. And we should all be aware that we, we vote with our wallets, right? If we buy cheap disposable stuff, there will be more of it. And that's the thing that also needs to stop. That's our responsibility for us and future generations. Constantine, you strike me not only as an incredibly brave leader, but obviously quite intelligent as well. And it seems like you have a lot of ideas. There must be a big question that keeps you up at night. What is that? So the big question that keeps me up at night is whether we can undergo the changes we've been discussing for an hour now at the speed that is necessary because uh, the problem is so urgent and I'm, I'm really worried that it might be too late. So that is something that really keeps me up at night. And also sometimes I feel that our impact, while I'm so passionate about doing what we're doing, especially at our company, but also as society as a whole, I think that we the impact might just not be big enough. So this is something that really keeps you awake at night. But let's make sure that this doesn't sound negative because again, I'm I'm an optimist, I'm a techno utopian, and I really think we can fix all these problems. But the urgency and the, the sheer scale of the problem, that is something that that worries me and that keeps me up at night. And Franz? I feel that all of those industries just need more. Constantines, you know, more disruptors, more people that move into this this space with a very different thinking. And that's what I would hope for because it is, an, you need to have a sense of urgency and you need to have an entre entrepreneurial spirit and those two things come together. I think that's something I would just hope for. Constantine and Franz, thank you so much for just such a beautiful, personal, powerful discussion, which really 
tells all of us that we each hold a core responsibility for the impact, the shift, and the pivot that we need to make for a better world. Constantine, I appreciate you going deeper into culture, organizational design, and how at Wirelane, your priority is not only getting the job done, but how to create joy for every single person there and the importance of that. And Franz talking about the only way through is to actually ensure that we have shared purpose amongst many key stakeholders. Thank you so much to both of you for this very powerful discussion. Thank you, Constantine. Thank you, Franz. Thank you, Deidre. It was my pleasure. Thank you, Deidre. The Big Question is brought to you by IDEO. To find out more about us and how we create positive impact through design, head to IDEO.com. And then make sure to search for The Big Question in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Make sure to click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at IDEO, thanks for listening.